Hi, this lecture is on uh, CUSS systems, which is one of the uh, sort of abandoned branches of nuclear fusion research uh, that has been pursued over the last 70 years. I bring CUSS up because uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, historical lesson on different research ideas and looking at how they compare and contrast to other fusion research ideas and how this approach has still been uh, produced and uh, observed uh, and developed uh, in modern times at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. So essentially a cusp is two magnetic fields that meet at a sharp, um, a sharp uh, abutment. So two north poles that face one another or, or two electromagnets that face one another north and north form cusps in the middle where the fields reject one another and push each other away. It's essentially the opposite of a mirror. If you're studying the mirror approach, that is two dissimilar poles that um, are butting up against each other a north to a south or a south to a north. And the field lines continue from one and then flow into the magnetic field of the other and kind of form a continuous um, uh, flow. Uh, cusps are the opposite. And if you, the most basic one is uh, a biconic cusp, that's two rings, two electromagnets that are facing one another uh, that are rejecting each other and, and creating actually magnetic forces between the two that are pushing each other apart. Uh, and that force structurally uh, is something that you would have to deal with if you're designing a cusp system or a mirror system for that matter, because uh, you also have uh, attractive forces that pull the rings together. So as you dial up the magnetic fields using HTS to 10, 20, 30 Tesla, you start to see these forces become very significant. And the, the superstructure of the reactor, the fusion reactor, has to uh, deal with all of that uh, using strength in the materials and other things. So um, cusp systems were first proposed by Dr. Harold Grad at New York University's uh, Courant Institute for Mathematics. Harold Grad uh, is now considered one of the forefathers of the field of magnetohydrodynamics, or MHD. Uh, his specialty was developing math equations and applying them to exotic configurations of plasma physics very similar to what Marshall Rosenbluth uh, kind of built his career on, um, applying a, a math equation uh, to a different configuration and then sussing through uh, the strengths and weaknesses of that configuration and predicting different uh, behaviors of bulk plasma at those different conditions. Uh, so Harold Grad was a professor at the Crane Institute at New York University. Um, he worked with uh, a Helen, who ended up becoming a very famous mathematician uh, in her own right and was awarded multiple uh, awards. Uh, so that's a picture of her and him. Um, uh, his proposal was to form a cusp system. And in the center of a cusp system, there is a pocket of no magnetic field. Uh, and plasma that's inside that pocket uh, of no or weak magnetic field uh, behaves very differently than if it was in a magnetized system because because there's no magnetic field, plasma can move in relatively straight lines and is not magnetized uh, in that little region. Um, he wasn't the only one who proposed ideas. Uh, Jim Tuck, who also pioneered pinch research, uh, played with this concept a lot. Uh, and he wrote a paper where he spelled out multiple different configurations, including the picket fenced or the ring picket fence or the toromac, which is essentially a tokamak with a cusp field on the outside. Um, the basic idea uh, was that, uh, well, one of the one of the advantages of cusps that one of the early advantages that made it um, interesting to people uh, was the idea that the plasma moves to the outside tracks of a field. So plasma will move from a tight field to a low density field if possible. And, and this happens in tokamaks uh, where scattering uh, reactions will push material to the edge of a plasma of a tokamak field uh, and then eventually maybe scatter it in the wall. But in a cusp system, that same effect would push material into the center, which would reconfine it. Uh, and therefore, uh, they were arguing that they could kind of help the performance of the machine using this scattering effect, this down scattering or up scattering effect uh, to their advantage. Um, so uh, Harold Grad studied the system uh, through the 60s and uh, 50s and 60s and used rudimentary Fortran computer models to model plasma behavior 
and essentially worked out that there were different regions of the plasma. There was an adiabatic region and a non-adiabatic region where plasma would move in one direction, uh, and the differences had to do with if it was magnetized or not. Uh, Custs didn't die off then, even though Harold Firth uh, was one of the early people that, that sort of said, hey, this system is not going to work as a fusion approach. But it was pursued continuously in the 80s uh, by a fellow named Dr. Robert Bussard. Uh, Bussard was a physicist from Princeton. He had a PhD and he had worked on the ramjet concept and then fell in love with this cusp confinement system, uh, which eventually led to a machine called the Polywell. Uh, Bussard received over 47 million in Navy funding from 89 to about 2010 uh, time frame, uh, and uh, he passed away. And then it was picked up by the work was picked up by Jay Young Park, who's a, a senior scientist from Los Alamos who developed uh, more uh, more insight and more uh, data into the the plasma cusp system, the Polywell. Um, basic polywell is uh, six rings that meet in the center, and there's a pocket in the center with no no fields. Uh, you inject plasma into the center, and the concept is to uh, get the plasma's diamagnetism, essentially its uh, its ability to make its own magnetic field, to reject the outside field, basically swell it up, kind of like a balloon, and push out the uh, cusp fields and lead to an enhanced trapping mechanism. Uh, and the enhanced trap, uh, people argue, if you're a supporter of the polywell, you would argue that that enhanced trap would lead to all sorts of great things like better better plasma confinement, lower radiation losses, uh, better um, thermal spread so that the ions are hot and the electrons are not. All sorts of great, wonderful things that keep it from becoming uh, falling into a bell curve and then sort of falling into the, all the, the things that Ryder um, argues has a problem. Uh, let me back up a second. So I mentioned Ryder. Um, what I meant by Ryder is Todd Harrison Ryder, who was a PhD student at MIT under Larry Linsky uh, in the mid, uh, mid early to mid 90s. Uh, Larry Linsky is, of course, famous for criticizing mirror machines uh, in front of Congress and writing uh, The Problem with Fusion, a famous article that kind of blasted a lot of fusion approaches and kind of killed support for fusion for many, many years in the 80s and 90s. Um, so Harrison Ryder was his PhD student uh, in the electrical engineering uh, department, uh, and he initially was hired by Linsky to be a supporter of uh, these cusp approaches that Bessard was pushing. Uh, and the approach was that Harrison Ryder was going to use the two fluid modeling approach, which is covered in another lecture on modeling approaches, which two fluid essentially treats plasma like two overlapping fluids, uh, one electron, one ion, and then they have an interaction term. So you model the ion fluid and the electron fluid uh, together or separate, and, and there are assumptions made, like some cases you, you treat the ions as steady or the electrons as background um, because of the relative size of one or the other. Electrons are really, really small. Ions are like a 1800 times or 18, yeah, 1800 times bigger, roughly. And you do this model to essentially uh, ask questions uh, and thus out like key things, like how long does it take for ion A to fuse in plasma B if it's X density? Or how much radiation is coming off a plasma with X distribution of energy? Or what is the ideal density for uh, the plasma to get to such as you have fusion uh, and you get to net power um, over a given volume of space? These kinds of rule of thumb, back of the envelope, uh, approximation questions uh, are in the two fluid model that you can kind of get. It's They're not great. Uh, there are better ways to model plasma now today, but in the 1990s, this was probably one of the cutting edges of plasma science at that time, plasma modeling at the time, because computer modeling wasn't really where it is today. But Harrison Ryder was basically given the task of sussing out the feasibility of the polywell using this two fluid modeling approach. And in the process of getting his PhD under Larry Linsky, he realized that the polywell was not going to work for a variety of reasons that he spells out in his 1994-1995 PhD thesis and uh, several papers that were accompanying that. Uh, and actually, I personally spent about 10 months in graduate school uh, just reading through that paper 
and trying to comprehend all the important and critical concepts in there. Uh, and I can just briefly cover it. Uh, Ryder models a Polywell system like a blob. A blob is an important concept that I want to talk about. Uh, it, it's the, the idea that the plasma is homogeneous, right? So it's uniform in all directions. Isentropic, so it's uniform in all directions. It has no structure, unstructured, right? And it's uh, quasi-neutral, meaning that the, all the positives and negatives are well mixed, and it's all just in a homogeneous, uh, unstructured, quasi-neutral state. So it's basically a blob of plasma. And the blob has um, a, a Maxwellian bell curve distribution of energies. Like all the ions, all the electrons are all kind of smooshed together in one big bell curve. So there's nothing special or unique about this plasma. And this was the model that he conceived for the polywell. He said that most of it's going to be like that. There's going to be a small edge region, maybe 5 to 10% on the edge. And there's going to be a small core region, maybe 5 to 10% in the middle, where um, plasma is going to be really, really dense, really, really hot. So once that's your conception of the polywell plasma, then the next question is, what uh, are the key metrics for that? So he asked all these metrics, like how long does it take ion A to fuse in density B, how, how much radiation is coming off of it, how much Bremsstilling radiation, IR radiation, um, synchrotron radiation, uh, all these different questions around radiations. Um, what is the minimum density you need to get to? What are the things fighting the density? What about angular momentum buildup, which is something that he did, and also um, uh, William Nevins uh, from Livermore National Laboratory also wrote a paper on that. Uh, so the two of them sort of tag team this a little bit. Uh, but essentially, given all these things, uh, Ryder argued that the, they were fundamentally limited, that the plasma was fundamentally limited, and it wouldn't be able to get to net power because of the radiation losses, the Bremsstilling losses, and other radiation losses were just higher than what you would expect to get from fusion from this plasma. Uh, and that paper on the polywell eventually became a much broader sweeping statement about many, many, many different approaches where the plasma didn't have a lot of recirculation or wasn't structured in some way. It's a, it's a tour de force, and it's a paper that's not really well understood because at the time he was grappling with very cutting edge concepts and very cutting edge models that were not really widely understood in the plasma community, plasma physics community. Uh, but now, nowadays, people will take Ryder's work and use it as a bludgeon to essentially excuse a new fusion concept, carte blanche, saying, oh, this won't work because it'll turn into a blob and then the blob will be fundamentally limited by these radiation losses that Ryder determined in the mid 90s at MIT. And so they just excuse a whole series of fusion approaches because of that. And I think that's very unfair. Uh, for a number of reasons. One, Ryder's work was limited by the models, uh, computer models and uh, mathematical frameworks that were available to him at the time. And those have greatly changed. Uh, we've gone way past the two fluid model. We've gone way past just having equations. We now have supercomputers that can model billions of particles at once at, uh, in real time. And so it's not even, not even close to a comparison. Uh, and then secondly, um, a lot of approaches may not necessarily fall into the blob like plasma category um, many approaches have some th something funny or unique or special or uh, some sort of trick that they are using to try to move away from that uh, sort of pit of this will not work approach so for instance we're trying to structure the plasma or we're trying to heat the plasma or we're trying to compress the plasma this gets to a larger point that i think all, all often gets lost when talking about writer's work which is the concept of, well, he showed us what not to do. He said, if the plasma looks like this, it will fail. Your machine reactor concept will fail. So everybody in fusion is trying to not be a blob. So for instance, in ICF, they don't have a blob because they're squeezing the plasma. They're compressing the plasma. In plasma structures, they don't have a blob because they're structuring the plasma. They're forming loops or a spheromax or dynamax out of this uh, fluid that conducts electricity. Uh, in pinches, they are not blob-like because they are squeezing the plasma as it flows through a pinch structure or being compressed from the outside by some sort of magnetic field. Uh, in General Fusion's case, they're not being a plasma blob because they've got a, a compactoid that's being squeezed from the outside. Uh, 
so in all cases, uh, being not the blob is a good thing. And if you're a reaction, if you're a fusioneer that's proposing a different concept or exploring a different concept, you should consider the writer's work as a direction to avoid and actually go in the opposite direction. And the more non-blob-like you can be, the better you are. So one of the things you can do is you can have efficient recirculation. If you have plasma moving around and it doesn't touch a wall uh, or any kind of metal surface, that's good. That's a good design feature, um, et cetera. So uh, uh, anyway, writer's work has a lot of significance uh, and it has sweeping implications for a variety of fusion of concepts, including in uh, particular the polywell. So back to the polywell. Um, polywell is developed by Robert Pissard and his company EMC2. Uh, they received 47 million, as I mentioned, from the Navy. Uh, Bissard was out in San Diego. He was developing this approach out there. In 2007, he gave a talk at Google, uh, uh, you know, kind of coming clean and coming open with all this work and trying to build support around uh, his fusion approach. Uh, I personally watched the talk when I was a, a second year grad student uh, on YouTube and it, it struck me and I, I devoted about five years of my uh, life to promoting the Polywell, uh, only to see that it wouldn't work in the end. And the reason why it won't work is uh, the heating mechanism. Uh, the, that's one of the main flaws. There are other flaws, but that's one of the main ones where the Polywell essentially works by trying to duplicate a fuser where you get a lot of negative charge or a lot of positive charge for that matter in the center of the, the cuss trap. And then you attract the opposite charge in and that builds up speed and causes collisions and fusion reactions. Um, Charge concentration doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, I mean, plasma physicists are taught this in college uh, and grad school. They're taught about the concept of quasi-neutrality, where in a given region of space, you have equal numbers, roughly, of positives and negatives. And you can't really deviate very much from quasi-neutrality, although certain examples certainly do, like alpha waves and other waves, where you know they get off by 3%, 1%, 2%, 4%, something like that. Um, Polywell, uh, to get to a 10,000 volts, you only need like a 5% deviation, but you can't do that. I mean, even if you try to start it, um, odds are either Coulomb repulsive forces will push the particles away or the charge will start sucking electrical, um, charges from the metal itself. So it may not even, the charges may not even come from the plasma. It'll start just pulling positive ions from the walls of the reactor itself to try to make up for any kind of charge imbalance. Uh, imbalances in charges cause all sorts of instabilities and all sorts of problems. Um, uh, and the plasma does not want to stay in one place and does not want to behave the way you want it to. And that heating mechanism just does not work fundamentally. Um, now, supporters, uh, I was a supporter, I can tell you, um, would argue that, hey, we can overcome this uh, charge imbalance or charge issue by having this enhanced cuss trap where the plasma diagnosticism is rejecting the outside field. And so therefore, the whole thing's going to work out anyway. It, it doesn't work in practice. Uh, so the heating mechanism is is one of the huge problems in the, the polywell. Uh, also, the cuss system trap, it, it's more debatable whether the cuss enhanced trap works, which is about where things stood in 2010. Uh, Bassard dies, uh, unfortunately. It was really sad to see him go. Uh, he was a huge advocate, even though at the end of his life he was really pounding the pavement for the polywell. Um, he had made a lot of major contributions, and it's not a bad idea to be a little bit of a contrarian in plasma physics anyway. So he passes away, and his company, EMC2, uh, they, they inherit about a million dollars in equipment. They, go, they, they hand it over to another company, which holds the material for a while until um, uh, the company can find a new lead scientist and CEO. So they pass the baton to Rick Niebel, who was a retiring scientist from Los Alamos National Laboratory, a very good uh, plasma physicist, who then passes the baton to uh, Jay Young Park, now, J.M. Park uh, is an excellent plasma physicist. He went to Princeton. He worked for Sam Cohen. Um, he had been a senior scientist at Los Alamos for 20 plus years, published uh, over 50 papers in plasma physics journals and, and a number of patents, and had actually worked on IEC concepts in the past. In 1999, he was involved in the POPS effort, 
which was essentially a scheme to uh, change the cage of a fuser and apply a, a rotating field such that the plasma would be more likely to oscillate through the center without um, hitting the cage and, and subsequently destroying the concept. Pops was an interesting idea. They were trying to go for transparency in the cage, uh, maybe making them out of carbon nanotubes or some other exotic material to try to get more plasmas to move through and, and, and reduce the conduction losses. And if that was possible, then IEC fusers would be maybe an approach to fusion power, which would be incredible given the fact that they are so small and simple and easy to build. But Pops, uh, that idea kind of died on the vine. Uh, it wasn't very good. Uh, but anyway, Jay Young Park was involved in that. So he had experience in IUC and he had experience in uh, Los Alamos working on uh, really some really strong plasma physics. So he took over. Now, Jay Young comes in with a different perspective than Bassard. He's looking at it from uh, the, the question of, can we just get this cusp effect to occur? Uh, regardless of the heating, regardless of anything else. Let's just see if we can trap this plasma in a really awesome cusp magnetic field. So he hires uh, Paul Bellany, um, uh, I believe is his name, and he hires uh, uh, folks from Simon Woodruff's team uh, in Seattle to build him an enhanced machine with better diagnostics. And he de develops a beautiful uh, uh, machine, WB7, uh, which was a smooth metal rings in a square configuration, making the cusp system in the center. And then he injects a uh, high velocity, high density carbon hydrogen plasma into the middle of that thing uh, to test the quality of the trap. So a number of changes there, if you're, if you're keeping track. One, he's not using fusion fuel. Two, he's created not really plasma injectors so much as plasma cannons to just dump current in there. Uh, three, it's carbon hydrogen, so it's not even we're not even trying for anything remote, um, remotely related to plasma conditions for fusion reactions. The goal is to simply see if we put a ton of plasma into uh, this cusp field, will we see effects? Will we see that diamagnetism, uh, diamagnetic property of the plasma exert itself? reject the outside field, squeeze off the pinch holes and create an enhanced plasma trap. That's the goal. Let's see if that happens. And the way he tests for that, incidentally, is he, two things. One, he looks for X-ray emissions and the X-rays emissions should persist longer after the fields are turned off, thus showing that like almost like when a water balloon pops and for a brief split second, all the rubber's gone and the water is formed uh, kind of a sphere in open space before it kind of collapses, if you ever see um, images like that. So he's looking for that same effect in plasma, where the diamagnetism is basically formed this semi-stable plasma structure for a brief period after the fields are shut off, uh, which would show up as extended X-ray emissions. And then the other thing is he's looking for uh, flux loop measurements, which... A flux loop is a ring of a metal in a circle uh, that uh, picks up the uh, created magnetic field generated by the plasma. And if he sees that, then he sees the effect. Well, long story short, that paper 2014 announces that plasma diamagnetism can affect uh, and reject cusp fields, therefore leading to an enhanced magnetic trap. Now, enhanced plasma traps is a great trick, but it's probably not enough to build a fusion reactor around that idea. Uh, it's not a big enough effect uh, that would allow us to balance out all the other effects that occur in fusion plasmas. And by the way, uh, the effect might also be limited by interchange instabilities and other problems with the cost system. So. Um, it, it was a great bit of work, but it wasn't enough to prove that this cusp system was going to work as in a power plant. But uh, at the same time, uh, that idea had been picked up by Lockheed Martin. The Lockheed Martin Skunk Works uh, had started a cusp system design program in 2007. Uh, the first person to work on that was Dr. Thomas McGuire who had just wrapped up his PhD at MIT working on multi-weld fusers. Uh, see the IECT lecture for details on that. And he was recruited out to Palmdale, California by Lockheed Martin Skunk Works to develop a cuss system trap uh, 
and try to develop a compact fusion reactor around that idea. The compact fusion reactor would have been small. It would have been about the size of maybe a minibus or a car or an SUV. Uh, and it w would have contained plasma. And the only way it would work is through this enhanced cup cusp trapping effect where the magnetism is shielding off the outside field, squeezing off the pinches, and then therefore trapping the material in the center. Um, so uh, Ryder, or, excuse me, excuse me. McGuire comes out there. He starts working on that in 2007. They build a series of machines, T, T1, T2, T3, T4, uh, to try to improve the quality of the machine. And uh, the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works has a lot of money. Uh, they have tens of millions of dollars uh, going through the program. And they have eventually a staff of 60 different uh, engineers, scientists, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, modelers, plasma physicists, pulse power experts, vacuum experts come through that uh, facility and work on that machine or a series of machines. Uh, they also have a slew of diagnostics, the kind of diagnostics that would make any plasma physicist drool including flux loops, Langmuir probes, uh, IR detection, Thompson scattering, X-ray detection, and, and a variety of other things. So Lockheed's approach uh, is slightly different than the Polywell. It, it, one thing they do is they completely abandon uh, the entire um, electrostatic confinement heating approach where you try to get more negative charges in one place. They just throw that whole idea out and they switch to neutral beam injection, which is a more conventional um, way to heat ions. Uh, it's used on tokamaks accelerators all over the world. Essentially, you electrostatically accelerate a, a bunch of ions in a beam, then you recharge it so that it's all homogeneous and inject it into the center of this machine and create a hot plasma in the center of this cusp confined trap. Lockheed was uh, super classified. The funding research was funded by the Air Force. Uh, they, you know, they argued that we could have a fusion reaction reactor and put it on an aircraft. That's how small it could be uh, if this cusp effect works the way we hope it does. Um, so it was super classified. Uh, Lockheed did a couple other innovative things. So for instance, um, the poles that hold the electromagnet uh, inside the center of this chamber were electrically charged. They put a dipole on there, uh, which caused the material to avoid the poles and reduce conduction losses in the reactor. So that's an inter interesting innovation uh, that I don't think was really noticed, but it comes out in their 2016 APS paper uh, or poster, excuse me, that I read uh, and I wanted to point it out. Um, they also did some really cool modeling uh, of the plasma. They used uh, Grad Sharnoff modeling, which is sort of uh, the way I would describe it is isometric bars of magnetic field. And then you have uh, different equations where it sort of solves for the structure that would evolve that's thermodynamically favored to evolve under a magnetic field of X configuration or Y configuration, that sort of thing. Um, and they did models like that. They also did models uh, showing um, plasma behavior and they measured uh, uh, flow around the outside of the rings. So um, all of this uh, continued through 2019 at least. Uh, by 2021, however, it, the program had been shut down. Um, I don't know if they got good results or not. They did not formally publish any work in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. Uh, they did do talks at um, APS meetings and they did posters, but they were not allowed to um, pr pr promote this stuff in, in formal physics papers which is really a shame and one of the reasons why I argue that plasma physicists need to be open about all their work. Um, the Lockheed Martin team spent, um, you know, maybe $60 million or something on that order and spent between 2007 and 2020, roughly 13 years, developing an approach to fusion and pursuing a line of research that has not been shared or published with the world. And what this means is that in the future, some other team or group or university or corporation may try to do the same thing and may run into the same problems as Lockheed did. Uh, and that, that's unfortunate because it just means that fusion uh, research as a field does not learn from its mistakes and just continues to repeat the same stupid mistakes over and over and over again. Uh, or 
or maybe there is some innovation that Lockheed hasn't thought of uh, that another team with a different perspective would see and learn from. Uh, but again, we're not publishing, so we're not going to learn from that work. Uh, again, I, I called for open publish publications at the time, and I, I'm going to call for it again now. I think Lockheed really needs to publish its, its stuff. Okay, so that's uh, sort of a two-second uh, history of Cuff Systems. We talked about Jim Tuck. Uh, and his, uh, we talked about Harold Grad first with his cost ideas and modeling work, uh, sort of from a theoretical mathematical standpoint back in the 1960s, 50s and 60s at the Current Institute. We talked about Jim Tuck, who proposed and played with the concept of a cost system and proposed things like the Toromac, which was a tokamak with the cost of uh, things on the edge and a picket fence. We talked about Robert Bussard's interests in the polywell uh, and all the work that went into that, how they received Navy funding for many, many years. We talked about Jay Young Park's results, which were really exciting from 2014, 2015 timeframe. Uh, Park really showed that the diamagnetic effect uh, could, in fact, impact the plasma, the magnetic fields. And it, it was a real effect. There was um, evidence and data that supported that. Uh, but again, the effect might not be significant enough to make any real impact. And the people on the team that knows the most about all this, Lockheed Martin, unfortunately, has not published. Uh, so there's very little uh, data and information on what they've done. Although, uh, if you're interested, I did write a great article, an intensive analysis of Lockheed Martin's approach, uh, which came out in 20, uh, I think, 15, 16 or 17. Uh, and it's worth a read if you're if you want to learn more about Lockheed Martin's approach. Uh, the other thing I would say is it, it, all of these approaches can be scaled up uh, with higher fields. The question is, will those fields really help you as you go up to 30, 40 Tesla uh, with HTS magnets? Uh, that about sums up cus systems. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Hope you have a good evening.